Welcome to the Seniors Flourish podcast, where it's all about helping occupational therapy practitioners working with older adults be the best they can be. And now your host, Mandy Chamberlain. Welcome to the Seniors Flourish podcast. I'm Mandy Chamberlain, and today's topic is focusing on occupation in occupational therapy. And I am joined with Sarah Stromsdorfer. I didn't torture your last name this time. (laughs) She's an occupational therapist, and she also um, blogs at myotspot.com. So we've connected through, gosh, Sarah, how did we connect? I think I emailed you. Maybe oh, like six me. months ago, like trying to find another adult OT blogger. It's kind of hard to find some of you. Some I know. Of us. I know. We got to stick together. <laughs> we have to stick together. So yeah, we I, we connected through mainly initially through social media, which is where I connect with most of the OTs these days. Um, but we're going to talk about you know how we make sure that we are using occupation based activities um, in our occupational therapy treatments. It sounds super obvious. <laughs> But um, I think sometimes you it, it's not as easy as we think it should be. So, Sarah, let's talk a little bit about kind of like your background, how you got into OT, what you're doing now. Just kind of start there. All right. Awesome. So I just graduated in August of 2015 with my master's at Brunel University in Atlanta. Um, I started my OT journey working in inpatient rehab as a patient care tech and was doing a lot of ADLs with my patients and saw what OT was doing and thought it was awesome and went from there doing my observation hours, applying all over. And after 27 long months of OT school, it's great to finally be done and working in the field. So what are you working in right now? So right now, I'm technically PRN, but I work five or six days a week. Um, I split my time between inpatient rehab and acute care, and then I dabble in a little bit of ALF, geriatric outpatient, like three hours a week. So I'm kind of all over the adult rehab spectrum. But that's, you know, kind of exciting, like from a newer grad view. Like you kind of at least get to kind of dabble and see what area you like the most in or... I don't know. I think it's kind of a neat uh, perspective. And you have the perspective of being recently in school and and now working. So you kind of have that. that the best uh, of both worlds. Yeah, yeah. I've been out a little while, so I maybe, you know, I try to keep up on what's going on in schools. But it's, so it's kind of neat to see, like, especially with your website, it's neat to see, like, some of the things that you've experienced as a student and now as a clinician and how, you know, the transition between the two. So what I, um, I guess one of the other questions I was thinking about is, like, how did you originally get in OT? Is it just from being a tech? Mm-hmm. And how did you even become that? You know, like, how, what, what, what was the journey of that that made you decide OT was for you? Yeah, so I started, um, I was getting my bachelor's in psychology and thought I wanted to be a nurse after that. I figured, well, let me finish this bachelor's degree and then get a job as a tech and happened to be, um, there was an opening for days in the inpatient rehab hospital in St. Louis and, um, started there and realized, wow, I really love what the therapists are doing. I loved seeing every day, the patients just making this amazing progress. Yeah. I want to be all about that. I want to be a part of that. And I'm so glad I got into that inpatient rehab unit because otherwise maybe I wouldn't have even known what OT was and would have gone on a different career path that maybe wouldn't have been for me. And that's actually super interesting because you're talking about like inpatient. And I th- even think sometimes in inpatient settings, like people don't even know what occupational therapy is. Do you feel like, do you find that when you're working in inpatient? Like, I feel like sometimes the patients are just, you know, they're in the hospital and everything's so acute and there's so much going on. There's people coming in and out, in and out, in and out. And like trying to explain what occupational therapy is and like what we're doing. What's your experience with that? I'm finding that it's a lot more of a challenge in the acute care setting because an inpatient mm-hmm. rehab, I'm so used to everyone knowing what OT is. Right. You're going to help me learn how to dress again <laughs> or learn how to go to the bathroom. But right. in acute care, who are you? What are you right. doing? And, and now when there are it's just like medications and there's just so much going on in acute care. It's hard to sometimes distinguish like so many I think from a patient. 
Yeah. And like what a patient from a patient standpoint, they just have so many people coming in all the time and trying to, they're just trying to get better and trying to get back to the next stage. It's really kind of a funky, uh, you know, setting sometimes. So I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, um, since you, um, have recently been a student and now that you are working, um, what are the differences that from what you learned in school compared to, let's say what you see in the workforce? Like sometimes I feel like when you are, when we're students, we're really focusing on occupation base because we're occupational therapists and how do we have distinct value and how do we make a, um, you know, show that we are a worthy profession. And then we get in the workforce and sometimes I feel like it's lost. What do, what's your experience since you've kind of been more of a recent student to clinician transition? Yeah, I agree. It's so focused in school on um, providing occupation-based treatments, which I'm all about. I think that is why we're occupational therapists. Um, we learn in school, the rainbow arc isn't functional. The arm bike yeah. isn't functional. Um Big puzzles aren't functional, but then coming out into the field, that's all the therapists are doing. Not all of the therapists are doing, but I was seeing right. that and so confused. Like, why, what is, how is this benefiting our profession as occupation based? So I'm really glad to have this discussion of how we can maybe bring more occupation back into the treatments. Do you have any insight on why you think this has shifted? I mean, why do you think that? there's such a difference between what we're actually taught and what we actually do. Any ideas on that? I wonder if it's um, maybe some therapists just get stuck in a rut, they're bored, so they're providing just kind of the same rote interventions and they're not really thinking critically. Um, mm -hmm. They're kind of, they're just maybe feeling burned out. Maybe they need to switch settings for a little while or something, but they're not really putting a lot of thought or clinical reasoning into why they're doing these interventions or how is it doing a large puzzle helping someone who had a hip surgery kind of thing. Right. So maybe, right. yeah, I think it's maybe just the boredom. Yeah. I, I think, I think that there's, I don't know. I just, from my experience, I think there's a couple things about it. Um, I think part of it is, there, the, if you've really focused on the medical model or you're in a hospital and sometimes, I mean, I, I even had patients that say like, I just want to do exercise. And you're like, oh, and trying to explain to them what an occupational therapist is, why we do it. You know, there's, there's obviously clinical <laughs> and uh, um, research to support occupation and how it helps transform the brain and how it you, there's better carryover and all these different things. But like, sometimes, honestly, I feel like it's just so much effort. And Pete, like you said, sometimes maybe people get you know lazy or tired and it does take more effort because if you're really focusing on what a patient needs and what a patient wants, it, it, I mean, we have all these other dynamics that you personally as a clinician have to deal with, you know, productivity levels and, you know, trying to get everything done and trying to be efficient and effective. And it's like, there's, you're being torn, you know, pulled in a billion different ways. And then to be creative and <laughs> occupation based, sometimes, like you said, it's sometimes it, it is easier to just give some exercises, do some preparatory, you know, activities, which is important. Like there is, a, there is a spot in our OT spectrum for that, but it's like, you know, like we have to get back to our roots a bit. So, I mean, why do you think, you know, why do we need to be occupation based? I mean, that's a pretty obvious question since we're occupational therapists, but I mean, like, I really think that we need to make sure that we are protecting our own um, profession. Is there anything, I mean, any ideas or um, thoughts on that? Absolutely. I think even if occupational therapists and CODAs were to look at what are their patients' deficits, think about maybe the rote intervention they would provide and think of an <laughs> occupation-based version, like folding clothes in standing can work on standing tolerance, um, working on reaching low surfaces in a staff refrigerator, re putting up dishes in a high surface, that's working on mm -hmm. functional reach, Um just kind of making it because doing something like a rainbow arc isn't going to help the rehab patient going home if they're going home with minimal supervision. Um, just kind of focusing on the patient's deficits, but like providing an occupational intervention to 
work on. Yeah. That. I think that'll help keep our profession, um, you know, reimbursable and yeah, no, that no, you're exactly, exactly right. And, you know, like if you think about um, other professions, physical therapists, um, recreation therapists, I think I've all, obviously all of them have a role in the healthcare realm, but like trying to make us distinct. And like you said, how, you know, making sure that we are doing something that's providing um, obviously a value, but also that, you know, insurance companies are going to pay for, mm-hmm. you know, physical therapists, they, um, you know, they have to write goals based on function to a degree. Um, you know, they want to make sure that what they're doing relates to function too. So like trying to make sure that we have, like you say, dis- you know, distinct value and like that we are occupational therapists and like what makes us different from a physical therapist or a recreational therapist or a music therapist or, you know, some of those types of things. Um but also, I think that's why it's really important to support our national and state, you know, OT organizations. I mean, like, Absolutely. they're the ones lobbying for us and, tr- you know, trying to make sure that we are, we continue to be a reimbursable service. Do you ever see that? Um, you know, like, what kinds of things do you find with, like, specifically um, physical therapists if you're working in um, acute care? Do you ever have that overlap? And how do you find that you can make yourself distinctive? I'm finding in acute care, um, I feel like a lot of what they're doing from what I've been seeing the last couple of months, a lot of it's pretty mm-hmm. much just walking in the halls and doing stairs. And then I remember yeah. um, when I was training in acute care, one of the OTs was saying, well, we can't really walk them in the halls for functional mobility because it's duplicating. So what I kind of said was, well, if I have a patient that wants to walk, I'll walk them to the staff. There's an open coffee area. Um, so yeah. I walked my patient to the coffee area and had her make a cup of coffee and documented what deficits it was addressing. So I can still walk with the patient, but right. I want to make it functional. And um, and I'm noticing in the inpatient rehab setting, um, PTs are doing toilet transfers a lot more now. Really? Yeah, but they're not... Wow. It's interesting. They're not documenting it as that. They're documenting um, dynamic sitting balance, okay. um, sit to stands from low services. But it's getting it's inter- and the patients do need that because they're not going to yes. have the OT do a toilet transfer with them every time. But right, it's interesting. Um, I hope that the PTs don't start documenting toilet transfer and billing for self care because that's really going to you know reimbursement is going to say why do you need OT then if the PTs can do all of this. Right. Right. And that, that's, that's exactly right. And, you know, and that's the funny thing. Like I have kind of like a, oh, like a, I'm trying to think of the right word for it, but like my, my, our ultimate goal is to help the patient. Right. So part of me feels like, you know, whatever discipline needs to do what they need to do to get the patient to the next level and independent and at their maximal, you know, level of independence, let's do it. I don't care if it's nursing, OT, PT, you know, that's half of me. (laughs) <laughs> and then the other half of me is like, we need to make sure that we are absolutely providing the documentation and providing the services that show our distinct value and that we are providing the activity analysis and that we are, you know, like doing the occupation based um, treatments and that we are actually trying to get these, um, you know, these treatments to translate to real life so they can, you know, succeed at home. So it's like, I kind of almost have like a little bit of uh, you know, turmoil in my own brain because I'm just like, right. I kind of be a little bit of an idealist. I totally agree with that, that I totally am an idealist sometimes because I'm just like, whatever works, which I truly like from a basic standpoint, believe that. And I think that that's what we want to do. But the other part is like, oh gosh, we will, we do have to absolutely make sure that we are doing, showing what we do and why it's important. <laughs> you know what I mean? Definitely. And I think it comes down to just documenting, you know, the activity analysis part instead of just saying patient did toilet transfer, a patient did a meal prep, Mm -hmm. you know, saying why it's important functionally and that kind of thing. Yeah. So like when you're talking about like doing, um, we can talk about, it doesn't even have to be acute care because you work in, um, you know, assisted living facilities and do a little bit of everything. But when you are working on an occupation based intervention. Um, how do you, how do you choose that? Like, how do you decide what you want to do with the patient? Do you kind of just, is it kind of just a spontaneous thing, whatever the patient's talking about, or do you kind of plan ahead? And I actually personally feel like it's easier in certain settings than others. 
But I just kind of wanted to hear, like, what is your experience or what do you think about that? Yeah. So it's been a little bit tougher doing, um, I'm not in patient rehab full time anymore, so I don't know the patients as well. So I'll right. ask them at the start of the session, what's hard for you? Mm -hmm. Um, what do you do at home? What kind of that kind of thing. So if they're, um, if their standing tolerance is poor or their activity tolerance is poor, usually the first occupation based intervention I like to go to <laughs> that they all love is making a cup of coffee in the kitchen. So it's seriously, so yeah, they love it. It's I, I think that would be my number one occupation. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, <laughs> that I would like want it's, to. Yeah, it's yeah. my favorite occupation, of course. Um, <laughs> just a side note to any students: definitely check with um, the dietary restrictions because I just had a patient yeah. the other day. He just dumped like six packets of sugar in the cup of coffee, and oh. I was like pretty confident that he was diabetic. He, <laughs> oh, no. Thank goodness he wasn't. That happens to everyone. It's not just they, you. so they are not very um, necessarily careful with their restrictions. Check with that first. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but they love it. it. It works on standing, sit to stands. Yeah. A lot of times they'll able, they're able to support themselves on the counter, working on functional reaching, fine motor if they need it, opening the Splenda packets, the creamers, and then the coffee um, containers are pretty heavy. So sometimes I get a little they worried are. and I'll help with that <laughs> if they need yeah. it. But I feel it. That's my, that's my latest favorite one that I do with people that they enjoy and they don't even really feel like it's therapy. Which well, could be a good or bad thing. That's that's kind of I mean, like, obviously you want to explain to them why we're doing it and what we're doing, but like that should kind of be the if it's important to them, right? Then to, when we're practicing these things, it should be more fun. It should be something that they enjoy doing. And I, you know, I usually use that personally and just say like these are things that you do all the time at home. We're just integrating it into therapy, working on different activities or working on things like like you said, balance or reaching or those types of things. Something we're going to do anyway and we want to make sure that you can do it and do it safely. I mean, you know, they're using all sorts of different equipment, walkers and that they've never used before and it's like it's totally it, different. It, it's the same type of task, but it's not the same type of task at all. <laughs> it's really right. not the same type of task, but they think it is. Right. You're like, I can make a cup of coffee. Not a big deal. And but you're like, realize, oh, Ooh, standing for longer than a minute is not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you're using a walker like you've never done that before. Ooh, and and walker just... safety in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gosh, that's a... You could have a topic. You could have a podcast just on that. <laughs> like yeah. like the safe, just safety period. Yes. It's, it's crazy. But yeah. But I mean, like, that's the thing. Like, of course, occupational therapists, like our focus is if we can focus on activity, activity analysis, which we've heard a billion times, but it's true. If we can break down the tasks and say like, okay, you know, like what does a, you know, instead of having them stand and do a arm, you know, arm or a, what rainbow, do you call it? Rainbow, rainbow arc. arc rainbow yeah. arc. Yeah. Like what are they doing? We're just crossing midline. We're reaching. It's standing tolerance. Be balanced. You can put them on uneven surfaces. I mean, there's so many things that go into that one task. Why don't we do something, even if it's not, you know, occupation based, like you said, like coffee, if you're in a nursing home, you're not going to be making coffee right. every, necessarily every day. But I mean, you can do something that they enjoy, you know, crossword puzzles or even or just I mean, there's there's lots of things that they enjoy doing uh, that you can in integrate. And so would that be technically occupation based? Not technically, but it's definitely purposeful. I think yeah, and it, if they enjoy it, it's client centered. Yeah. And, you know, it's simulating a task or something they enjoy and getting them ready to go home. But it's way different than just doing exercises all the time. But I mean, I think there's a time and a place for exercises. Sometimes you really have to focus on, if you're looking from a medical model, like there's a certain point where you do have to like, you have to focus on certain strengthening or pain reduction strategies and you know, that kind of things. Let it be for using tens units or whatever, but you know, it has to be a mix. It can't, I mean, we have to go back to why are we occupational therapists, you right. know? Yeah, sometimes they, they definitely need the strengthening before they can do a toilet transfer. If they've been in the ICU or the LTAC for two mm -hmm. months and then they come to rehab and they can barely sit edge of bed, strengthening then definitely has a time and a place. And Yeah, yeah. Some therapists just give the arm exercise to every single patient every single time. And that's when you get into, well, is this a personal trainer or is this occupational therapy? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's kind of, that's kind of, I think too. And so, you know, and every, every therapist, I mean, every OT practitioner, let it, let it be, you know, an, an occupational therapist over an occupational therapy system. We all have our own, you know, way of doing things in our own style, I guess you could say. 
But I think, I think the big thing is just kind of encouraging people to think about occupation based and, um, trying to make sure that we're doing that since we are occupational therapists. So what would you say, Sarah? Like, what are some ways that you can grade some of these activities? I know some people say like, Oh, you know, I can make coffee and you can work on dynamic standing and, you know, reaching and that kind of things. But then it's like, how do you grade it? It's like, how do you make it harder for a patient that to make sure that they are, you know, um, improving or, cause I think that gets a little bit easier when you're doing exercise. It's really obvious. Like mm-hmm. you can say like, Oh, I'm doing five pounds today. Tomorrow I'm doing six pounds or whatever you're progressing. However, you're progressing that, um, exercise. But I think some people kind of shy away from o- occupation based activities because they don't know how to make it skilled and they don't know how to grade it. So do you have any ideas or ways, suggestions on that one? Yeah, sometimes um, in the ALF setting, I'll have a patient make their bed with wrist weights on, whether it's mm-hmm. one pound, two pound, or functional reaching in the closet, taking out summer clothes and putting their other clothes away with the wrist weights. And then they'll definitely tell you, like, this is a lot harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's kind of how yeah. I've been doing it lately. There are so many ways to grade things um, up or down. The grading it down, of course, you could have them doing the meal prep task and see it if they can't tolerate standing. They're still working right. on some sitting balance. Um, right. I mean, a couple other um, ideas I have, you know, things like, you know, if you're trying to do dynamic standing balance, you can even put them on like an on uneven surface, like a mm-hmm. aromat or oh, something yeah. like that. If you want to challenge them that way, you know, if you're doing, you know, reaching the closet instead of just at shoulder height, put it up on the shelf, you know, and you can kind of document that. Um in, you know, I'm trying to think of some other examples. Like mid, if you're crossing midline, it could be something close to your body and then you could have it, you know, 12 inches away. I mean, the big thing is, is like, you know, there's lots of ways to grade it. I think you just have to document it and which is also <laughs> sometimes a challenge because we are, you know, in a time crunch, we're trying to get it down. Like what is the best way to document that? And like I said, when you, you know, document exercises, it's really, really easy. And when you are documenting an occupation based intervention, um, you're typically working on a ton of things because you're, you broke down the activity for activity analysis, but it's also like trying to, um, figure out how to document that. So like, how do you document it? Do you document stating of the activity you're doing or do you break it down per your activity analysis or how do you document yours? That's such a good question because I'm still <laughs> struggling with documenting. Yeah. Cause I know in school they tell us and in field work, don't focus on the medium. But when it's yeah. occupation based, I do focus on the medium in a sense where I'll say <laughs> simple meal prep with emphasis on standing mm-hmm. tolerance, um, functional reaching, dynamic ba- standing balance, fine motor coordination. I mm-hmm. want to say, I remember one of my supervisors um, in my ALF setting. She's so funny. She always says, <laughs> Well, when I worked inpatient rehab 30 years ago, 20 years yeah. ago, sorry, Nancy, if you're listening, I don't think it was 30 years ago, <laughs> um, she would say, We used to just say baking a cake. <laughs> and now you can't uh, obviously just write baking a cake. You have to focus on the deficits right. that you're working right. on. So I always think about her saying, you can't say baking a cake. You can't just bake a cake. <laughs> oh, that is our roots though, isn't it? <laughs> baking it is. cakes, cracks. Yeah. And that's why it's like, we need to kind of go back to that. <laughs> You know, and that's kind of when I document that, I'm um, just kind of building on what you said, Sarah. Um, I, I, I always, I usually typically write the activity that we did because I typically am working PRN. So I want to make sure the um, primary therapist or um, OT assistant knows what, I, what I did with them. And then I kind of break it down, kind of like you said. So I'm using the activity analysis and saying, I'm focusing on this, documenting that, you know, I, and then if you progress it or grade it up, you have to make sure that you are stating that. And so to show that you are progressing in those goals or progressing towards that goal. So like making sure that you're saying like, okay, stood for 15 minutes doing a, you know, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an example, like you said, putting, yeah, yeah. But then, okay, well now we're going to increase the challenge by standing on an aromat. She was able to do that, you know, for, you know, 12 minutes, but it would increase the difficulty or whatever it is. But we, it's really hard because we focus on, like you say, we focus sometimes on the occupation and we have to kind of actually 
break it down and use our activity analysis skills, which we all have, but it's, I don't know why it tends to be hard sometimes. I don't know. Especially when it's a newer activity that yeah. you're not used to doing. I'm finding that for me when I'm doing mm-hmm. new, now that I'm in acute care, I have to get more creative with my occupation-based treatments. Yeah. And limited to the patient room usually. So I'm like, okay, what am I going right. to do out of the room? Um, and then figuring out how to make it, you know, sound skilled and grading it up and down and reimbursable. Mm-hmm. I'm always worried about that for some reason. I know it's documentation, documentation, yeah, documentation. A, whole, a podcast series on documentation. It is. And you know, what's funny is, um, on my website, like people ask questions all the time and it's, which is great. I love it. But like the number one question is, uh, uh, you know, documentation ideas. And so I'm working on something along those lines, but it's, it's, it's a struggle for everyone. Cause you, it's, cause it's so important. Like we can't be, you know, people aren't going to support and hire OTs if we can't support what we do. Right? right. But it's like, so it's like, everybody gets nervous and like, are we documenting appropriately or, and it feels like the, the demands for documentation just keeps increasing and just making sure we're doing what we need to do and provide the care that we want, you know, that we need to do. So it's like trying to find that balance is, I think, really tricky. It's you know? very tricky, especially as a new grad. Uh, yeah. I was really struggling. So I'm glad you're creating something and let me know when it comes out because okay. I, <laughs> I know, I know. And, you know, kind of just another little um, tidbit on people. It, it depends completely on what setting you're, you're doing, but um, I've used the, you know, like the MOHO modified interest checklist. And, you know, maybe I haven't necessarily used it to its full advantage because it's real, it's really great and it's super comprehensive, but it talks about like um, things that people have done in the past, people, things that do currently or things that they're even um, interested in. And like, and it goes from everything from, you know, I enjoy, <sighs> popular music to, you know, checkers to puzzles. And they kind of go through all the interests checklist. And so like, I think in um, skilled nursing, especially when you're working with someone for a longer period of time, um, I think those types of things are really helpful because sometimes you just ask pa- you know, patients what they what kinds of things do you like to do? And they're like, nothing. I like to watch TV. <laughs> watch and you're like, uh, I know, and then yeah. You're, and you're like, I know there's something there's inside something you. Else, yes. There's something you'd be interested in, or there's something that I know in your past. And then, you know, you kind of build that rapport, use a little bit of crazy therapeutic, therapeutic use of <laughs> self. And you kind of like break down those barriers a little bit. And they're like, oh yeah, I used to be on a softball team or like something crazy. And you're like, really? That's amazing. Like, and then you can integrate some of those things um, and make it, you know, you know, try to figure out things that they enjoy and what they like. And then you can integrate that into your treatment session and they enjoy it more. You enjoy it more. And it just, it just makes it more fun. And it's totally client centered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just like, I don't know. I, I, in some ways, like it's more work, but in some ways it's not because it kind of just presents itself for you. They're like, oh, I had, I had a patient recently that, um, actually both her and her husband were in the nursing home. He was in because he had had a stroke and she, honestly, she came in to visit him and she fell in the, she fell in the hallway and broke her hip. It was, yeah, it was like one of those weird, crazy freak accidents. And so they were both in the nursing home for a period of time. Um, and she was his primary care- caregiver prior. And, you know, where I'm kind of going through some activities. So we see him for a while. They're trying to get him ready to go home and get their supports, family supports and that kind of thing. And she's like, I used to iron everything, jeans, sheets. <laughs> like <laughs> I was like, this is actually amazing because we are working on standing tolerance and, you know, activity tolerance. And I had her ironing like every, and she actually loved it. She's like ironing, standing, singing, and she would stand for so much longer with me than she would with the PT. Oh, like I'm sure. not, yeah, not like you know, of course, bashing physical therapists, but like you know, because she's you know participating in an activity that she finds purposeful, and she's having and she's enjoying it. She's like, I, she, I'm getting my roommates, you know, blouses, and I'm. <laughs> I, she had like a pile in her room that she would. Like, it was, 
it was actually really refreshing because she enjoyed it. She knew she was working on some things. And um, that's kind of like, you know, what that's what she wants to get back to when she's at home. So it's like, why shouldn't we be integrating these into our therapy? So is it harder? Mm, that's not because she told me what she needs to do and I can just adapt it to what her needs are. So it's, those are the things that are cool. Like, oh, yeah. and that's why we're OTs, right? <laughs> that's the perfect occupational therapy treatment. I know. Perfect story for a podcast. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm just going to kind of shift gears. Um, but I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about your website. So because it's such a really great, it's a great resource. And I think it's, there's not very many of us out there that, um, you know, create content and treatment ideas and resources for um, other OT practitioners that work with adults or older adults. So it's fun that um, I found you in the social media world. Yeah. <laughs> and so I just kind of wanted you to talk about it and let everybody know a little bit about your website. Yeah. So um, you just said there's not really a lot of adult <laughs> occupational therapy websites out there. And I learned that quickly in field work, um, look, Googling intervention ideas for dementia or neuro or stroke, you name uh-huh. it. There was really, there's maybe two, two or three <laughs> websites out there. Yeah. And um, so I figured, well, while I'm learning all of this as a student and as a new grad, maybe I'll just write it as articles to help me learn and then also to put it out there. So my OT spot is basically my learning cur- My learning experience is my first year and just remembering what I couldn't find on online and just creating articles for that for new grads or students or even people that have switched from pediatrics to adults or geriatrics. Um, just anyone looking for intervention ideas and still work, still definitely working on adding more and more intervention topics. Um, there's still so much that we need to add out there, but that was my, my main goal or my main idea for it was just to have another resource out there. Yeah. That's well, that's kind of initially why I started mine as well. So it's like, it, we have like the same mission, <laughs> you know, just yes. helping other OTs. I mean, it's just, it, you know, like we use the internet for everything and we look for resources, like you said, in treatment ideas. And it's just like, it's hard when there's so many amazing pediatric OT websites out there. We can get so tons and tons of ideas. So much content. And it's so fun. Like they have really fun activities. <laughs> and then it's like trying to find um, something else for kind of the rest of us that work with adults. I shouldn't say the rest of us because there's obviously lots and lots of areas that OTs working, but there's a large population of OT, OTs and OTAs that work um, with adults. So I think that's really cool. And like I said before, I think it's really neat that you, you know, since you are a recent-ish grad, it's really neat that because you have a different perspective than someone who's been working um, for a while. So, it's, you know, you have the student, you still kind of, without being a student in the student role, <laughs> Yeah, they say, and, you know, the first five years, you're still figuring everything out. And yeah, I, I think we're always still figuring it out. I feel like we're always trying to learn and new ideas. But yeah, you're right. You know, it's just trying to figure out, you know, how the whole thing works. Oh, I just remember you saying, like, your site's great, too, because you were saying you, you're you working out in the rural um, communities and there aren't any really other OTs out there a lot. So you're kind of on your own. And there's so many rural communities out there where – you're the only OT and there's, you know, they need, I know, it's like having a great support system, having you out there too for. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I feel, I feel like that's what kind of websites, you know, occupational therapy websites are kind of for right now is like looking for that extra support and like validating, making sure that you feel like, okay, I'm doing the right thing. Like, <laughs> Or am I doing the right thing? Right. Or is there something else I should be doing? Like just kind of getting some more ideas and feedback when you don't have it. Like, I don't know. I think I think that's really important. So it's cool. I'm really glad we're both in the um, OT blogosphere. <laughs> yeah, we need more. I know. <laughs> Absolutely. Is there anything else that you kind of wanted to add about your website or anything else before we kind of wrap up? Um, I think we kind of, we covered, you know, the basics of it. Um, I'm so excited to be talking with you about this. It's so great to have this as another medium, the podcast medium for all of us driving who don't necessarily have time to go on Google to Google something. So I hope, um, everyone gets some ideas for 
Switching it up, adding a little bit of occupation back into your treatments. Yeah, that no, that's exactly that's exactly right. I feel like I'm going to at the end of all my podcasts, I'm going to kind of do a little challenge to everybody, and then I'm also going to have that like OT goal of the week. Yes, yes, I am. So, <laughs> kind of just wrapping up, I guess like like just like Sarah said, I really challenge you to integrate more occupation based activities into your day. So I kind of mentioned earlier about using like the um, MOHO modified interest checklist. I'm going to put that in the show notes so you can kind of um, print that off and use it and check it out. Even if you don't like use it in its whole, like it gives you lots of ideas. Um, and then also um, if you go to my website at seniorsflourish.com backslash occupation-based kits, I have um, a big list of different types of occupation-based kits that you can like make and put in your clinic. If especially if you're working like outpatient or assisted living or skilled nursing that you have that you can just kind of take and use. Like I, you know, things like, like, like Sarah, you were saying like you have like a coffee or you don't have a coffee kit, but you were able to walk down with a patient and get, make a cup of coffee and use that. Right. So it's like, um, you know, using some of those things. So I'll put that also in the show notes. And then I just want you to make sure that you take action. Like, Use those occupation-based activities, use our activity analysis skills, and make sure that we are proving that we have OT distinct value. So um, the OT goal of the week is, are you guys ready? This is the OT goal. OT practitioner will instruct patient in one occupation-based activity in their work environment as measured by self-reporting with 100% accuracy within one week. I think you guys can do that. So thank you, Sarah, so much for joining me on talking about occupation-based activities and making sure that we are being occupation-based in occupational therapy. Um, So I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yes, and thanks, everyone, for listening. If you are an occupational therapy practitioner that enjoyed today's podcast, I invite you to check out The Learning Lab at seniorsflourish.com forward slash learning lab. The Learning Lab is the essential resource for OT practitioners working with older adults looking for more treatment ideas, support, and resources to be the best they can be. So whether you're struggling to find evidence-based treatment ideas, you don't have time to research for resources or patient diagnoses, or are even looking for ways to earn more professional development units, then the Learning Lab can help you become a more effective and efficient practitioner. With weekly educational videos, a huge resource and handout list, a bi-monthly journal club where you can earn professional development units, a supportive community forum, and even some exclusive member-only bonuses, the Learning Lab is the perfect place to help you be the best OT practitioner you can be. It's like having your own OT help desk. So check it out at seniorsflourish.com forward slash learning lab. Thanks for listening. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Senior Rehab Project at SeniorRehabProject.com.